Cool, yeah. So um, this uh, conference is a bit of an experiment with Green Alliance, as you can uh, tell. Um, but we've um, convened it because in the work that we've been doing this year, it's become really um, clear to us how important it is to discuss land use and land management as part of the wider um, economic system. Um, uh, it's quite clear to us that we need a uh, change in land use and, and land management to meet climate and nature goals. Um, but the extent to which uh, that needs to happen and the type of changes that are needed depend on changes that happen in other sectors and in the rest of the economy. Uh, on the other side, um, we uh, know we're going to need to remove carbon from the atmosphere and store it. But again, the capacity that we have to do that depends on the decisions that we're making about land use um, and land management. And then uh, in amongst all of this uh, are, of course, uh, people. And there's a real danger that the people uh, who uh, live and work on the land um, uh, are kind of lost uh, in these big discussions about uh, what needs to happen to, to tackle these environmental crises. So we've got uh, three panel sessions today uh, based on the work that we've been doing at Green Alliance. Uh, the first is about the scale up of greenhouse gas removals. Um, and how we can uh, do that in a sustainable way. The second zooms out a bit and takes a bit of a wider look um, at uh, the whole land use and land management system um, and the changes that might be needed uh, to meet climate and nature goals. Uh, and then in the final session, um, we start to think about people and how people are involved uh, in these um, change process and the role that communities might play in them. Um, we are really, really grateful to the Edwin Fairburn Foundation and the European Climate Foundation um, for uh, funding um, the work that's gonna get talked about today and uh, for supporting this, um, this event. A couple of housekeeping bits. For people who are here in person, we're not expecting any fire drills. So if um, uh, an alarm does go off, uh, the main fire exit is uh, out the back and down the stairs. There's also one um, here uh, on my left or your right um, if needed. Um, toilets, the women's toilets are on the this floor and the ground floor. The men's toilets are on the first floor and the third floor. Um, and finally, we uh, will be having uh, lunch in about an hour um, and then uh, there'll be a coffee break after the second panel session, and then we will be having some drinks afterwards. Please do join us for the drinks. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to struggle to find my way home. Um, <laughs> those, uh, all of those breaks will take place down on the ground floor. Um, if you come all the way down the stairs, go all the way around past the lift um, and in uh, a follow signs to the dining room. Um, that's where we will be having all of those breaks. If you do need to step out at any point um, today, we also have use of the um, Armstrong room, which is just across the hall outside. Um, uh, it doesn't have any uh, furniture or anything in it, but you can uh, you can use it if you need to. Okay, for people online, um, please do use the Q and A uh, feature on Zoom to pose questions for our uh, panel members. Um, and use the upload function if there are questions that you think uh, it's particularly important that get asked. Um, you can also use the chat function uh, to raise any technical issues or have discussion with uh, other people who are online, but we won't be taking questions off the chat function. With that, over to uh, Helen Bennett, um, Head of Climate Policy at Green Alliance for our first panel. Thanks, Jim. Hi, everyone. Welcome, um, good afternoon. I hope you're all doing well um, and looking forward to the first of three panel sessions this afternoon. So uh, yeah, I'm Helena, I'm Head of Climate Policy at Green Alliance and we've got a really brilliant panel to chat about um, removing and storing carbon without harming land and nature this afternoon. And this is off the back of some research that our land use team at Green Alliance have been doing. So you all know that government has set a target to reach net zero by 2050. And the net bit is what this is all about. It's not zero carbon. We'll still have some residual emissions in a couple of sectors, primarily aviation and agriculture. <laughs> um, and the net part of the equation comes from removing carbon and greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. There are two primary types of removals, nature-based solutions and engineered removals. 
we currently don't have engineered removals at scale anywhere in the world, really. Uh, but nature-based solutions, we do have. Uh, we have a lot of them. And in the UK in particular, there is quite a lot of scope for um, them being used to get this net part nailed down in 2050. The net zero strategy that the government published a couple of years ago anticipates a lot of growth in engineered removal. But at the moment, they aren't really being scaled up at the level that we need. An example of one of them that's kind of on everyone's lips at the moment is BEX, which is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. But recently, BBC's Panorama programme highlighted the danger of increasing biomass demand, primarily because of competing land uses that we need our land for in the UK. So if we don't scale up BEX, or we can't scale up BEX to the level that the net zero strategy thinks we need, what else can we do? There's a few different options. We can have a look at behaviour change, so getting those residual emissions that we've got left in 2050 down. We can think a little bit differently about how we use land, and we can also think about scaling up other engineered removals, such as direct air capture, which if you don't know, is basically just a bit of a big fan that like draws carbon down from the atmosphere. Um, but it doesn't really exist anywhere at scale at the moment, and definitely not in the UK. So in this session today, Lydia, my colleague from Green Alliance, is going to be presenting some research that explores a few different pathways getting to net zero um, while avoiding large scale up of VEX in the UK. And the panel here is going to discuss some of the risks and opportunities of some of these different pathways that we have developed. So I hope you're looking forward to it. And I'll just introduce you to our panel before handing over to Lydia. So Lydia is a policy analyst at Green Alliance. Uh, we have Georgia, who is chair of the Countryside Conference 2022. Uh, we have Eli, who is chief science and advocacy officer and co-founder of Carbon Gap and associate at Oxford. Uh, and we have Alyssa Gilbert from Core Hub at Imperial College London. Lydia, over to you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone uh, for coming here today, and great to have um, a full room from the from the beginning. So, as Helena said, I'm going to give a few insights um, from the work that we've been doing at Green Alliance on uh, greenhouse gas removals. So, as Helena said, we must remove emissions from the atmosphere to reach net zero at 2050, because in 2050, some industries will still be emitting carbon and other greenhouse gases. We can think of ways to remove carbon from the atmosphere as being either nature-based or engineered. And um, at Green Alliance, we are calling for prioritization of nature-based removals for three reasons. One is that it makes sense to taxpayers. It is less expensive to the taxpayer to invest in farmers to remove emissions from the atmosphere by scaling up uh, semi-natural habitats like woodlands than it is to invest in these engineered solutions. The second reason is that uh, payments for carbon removal provide an important income stream to farmers who are seeing the scale down of basic payments under our previous European Union common agricultural policy um, following Brexit. And the third reason is in the name of being nature-based removals, these have big, um, positive impacts for wild species who will benefit massively from the habitats that are created by farmers um, that sequester carbon. But even if we um, scale up nature-based solutions, um, in our work in thinking about the different pathways to net zero, to not need any engineered removals at all, we think <laughs> in our work we found that meat and dairy consumption would have to fall by about 90% to avoid any need for other removals outside of what can be delivered um, by expanding those, those nature-based solutions. Um, and, and, and as well as really be part of the So as Hannah said, then the, these engineered solutions are where we're looking to fill that gap. And in the UK government's net zero strategy, we see a large role for BEX, which is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Um, and it's important to think about what has to happen for BEX to deliver net negative <laughs> emissions, as that gives some 
insight into what biomass it might make sense to use VEX for. So for VEX to deliver net, uh, net removals, we need to, the biomass is burnt and the biomass is sequestered carbon as it's grown. It's then burnt, the emissions are released, but they're captured and they're stored following that burning. At that stage, if you did that perfectly, you'd be net neutral. So the biomass needs to regenerate for this to become a negative emission. And if we're talking about doing this to get net negative emissions on the balance sheet by 2050, then that regeneration would have to happen in that time. So things like whole trees take decades to grow. So it just doesn't make sense to be doing effects with those inputs if we want to have negative emissions on our balance sheet by 2050. In terms of what might be more sensible then, it would make sense to use products that would break down releasing carbon into the atmosphere on a relevant time scale. So agricultural waste and residues that regenerate that are um, forming every year would make more sense to use. But these waste products would be inherently limited um, in quantity. So the scale of VEX demand really dictates how well um, or yeah, how genuine the negative removals that VEX delivers are because too much demand for VEX will force the use of inputs which are less likely to deliver um, those removals in a 2050 relevant time scale. Um, and, and we need, so, so the demand is really important and that's where behaviour change comes in and delivering net zero across all our industries comes in as being really important to limit that demand and good governance is really important too. And this is why we're calling for the creation of an office for carbon removal that would um, have oversight of um, these processes and be able to ensure that the way that we're doing things like VEX is actually more likely to deliver um, genuine removals. Going back to pathways, um, the other um, technology that we've looked at in more detail is direct air capture, which um, yeah is a technology that is being scaled up at the moment. It will literally take carbon dioxide out of the air and um, put it into long-term storage, but you need to power that process. Um, so we, in our work, have looked at how much you'd have to scale up um, the power industry in order to supply that energy to run your direct air capture plants. And um, to give you a sense of it, um, if you didn't do any uh, scale up nature-based renewables or you didn't do any VEX, you'd be looking at building five new nuclear power stations to power the amount of direct air capture that we need to get the amount of renewables. <laughs> so you can imagine all the, um, there are many combinations of nature-based and engineered solutions within um, the bound where you go fully on direct air capture or fully on nature-based removals of behavior change. So, um, and we think the solution probably lies somewhere more um, in support of that. So I'll leave it uh, there for now and look forward to questions. Thanks, Lydia. Okay, I'm going to hand over to the panelists just for any kind of introductory comments about this general topic before we get into a bit more of a discussion. So, Alyssa, over to you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks for that introduction. New report. Uh, just to give people who don't know about the project that I work on a little bit of context. Um, I work at Imperial College on a project four, which is funded by UK Research and Innovation, and it's part of a large scale um, UK research investment to try and understand what it means to start using some greenhouse gas removal techniques at scale in different parts of the UK landscape. Um, the investment is very large by UKRI. It's a number of sort of five, six million pound projects, each focusing on a different type of greenhouse gas removal. Those projects are each five years long. And what they do is they try and test out what would it mean if we use a technology like biochar or enhanced rock weathering? What would it mean if we tried to use these techniques on farmers' field, we added those rocks. What would it mean for the quality of the crops? What would it mean in terms of um, the actual sequestration of carbon? And what would it mean for other kinds of impacts, of both positive co benefits, um, as well as any potential detrimental impacts on the environment? And those projects are really important to help us understand how the whole range of techniques that you covered in your report 
how they how they behave differently and also across different parts of the UK landscape. Um, our role at the heart of all of these different demonstrator, demonstrator projects is to consider some of the factors that cut across all of these different technologies and in fact cut across what we refer to as the kind of more engineered solutions as well. What are the factors that we need to consider um, more broadly to know if we're doing greenhouse gas removal in a good way? Um, and we know that some of those considerations are obvious, like are we actually removing carbon? And that might not seem so obvious and perhaps it's not always the focus that people take. First of all, that's very important. Are we actually removing carbon? But also then some of these other considerations that may relate, relate, relate to biodiversity gain, or at least no biodiversity harm. Um, they also relate to the whole life cycle of the program. But some other dimensions, and I think this is important, and I hopefully we'll come back to this. Um, I'd like to come back to the discussion. Is that although a project that I just described sounds very technical, scientific, and much of what we're doing is also scientific from social science perspective. It's as important that we understand what these can technically do in situ in a field or in a forest, as it's important that we understand how communities respond to these different techniques and technologies, um, and also what the public perception is of these different, you know, these different technologies, and what business models might work to promote them. And that's really important. Some of the things that we've seen recently in the news um, reflect a combination of perhaps the choice of wrong business models or a poor scaling up of business model approaches or a, a lack of engagement with, with different kinds of publics and different kinds of audiences in developing and scaling up technology. These are all parts of the research that we're doing. Um, I'm looking forward to um, including some of the detail of what it is that we're doing in the conversation. Brilliant, thank you very much. Eli? Thanks. Hi everybody, I'm Eli Mitchell Larson. I'll follow suit and give a little bit of context on what Carbon Gap is. We're a relatively new NGO. We launched at COP26 in Glasgow. Um, we're fully philanthropically funded and we're fully focused on carbon removals. And when we say carbon removals, we mean, or greenhouse gas removals, what I mean we get, uh, we mean all of the methods that take CO2 out of the air and store them with really any duration. And so our goal is really twofold. We're trying to help build a kind of cohesive ecosystem in, in Europe, by which we mean the continent. So most of our work is in Brussels, but we're also engaged in the policy process in the UK and in France. And we're trying to really uh, identify those gaps that exist on the kind of education ecosystem building front, but also engage directly in the policy process. So there's some really exciting active legislation in the EU right now that's going through the Brussels institutions that will help start to codify what do genuine removals look like uh, Etc. So that's a bit on carbon gap. I'm also a member of a research program at Oxford called Oxford Net Zero, where we try to look at questions of what constitutes durable net zero or really legitimate claims that companies or countries can make on the basis of perhaps purchasing or funding removal activities. And maybe to your prompt, just to kind of expand the conversation a bit, I think one thing that I'd like to uh, raise is just that. Again and again, we see that we will need all of these removal methods. I think everyone recognizes that. We tend to focus in on these categorizations like nature-based or engineered or within engineered facts. But most of the research, and actually just last week, uh, a really uh, helpful piece of document called the State of CDR was released, which Carbon Gap funded, which tries to look at what is the current level of CDR being conducted, but how much do we need? And in terms of that requirement, both to balance out those very difficult to decarbonize emissions, but also to get rid of all the emissions that we emit between now and the net zero date, because we're emitting those emissions in full knowledge of their climate impacts. So there's really no excuse other than to commit to, as soon as we get to net zero, we have to start chipping away at everything we emitted since 2023, and ideally since 1992 or maybe even 1850. So what the scientific research shows us is that we can't rely solely on BEX or DAX or tree planting or mineralization. We'll need that portfolio approach. So from carbon gas standpoint, we have to identify for each method, what's the limiting factor that's holding it back from uh, demonstrating that it can be conducted in a safe, effective, and, and let's say justly deployed way. And how do we try to unlock that progress so that we have that portfolio of methods to deliver the removal we need. So we need a portfolio. We need to think much bigger than net zero, right? We need to reckon with our responsibility to remove carbon that has accumulated in the atmosphere over the last 150 years. Uh, and I think uh, we need to think really carefully as well about uh, 
uh, how, and that's what the conversation today will be about, how the deployment of removals interfaces with other things we need to optimize for, like human well-being, food, and nature. So looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Georgia. Hi, um, I'm Georgia Ferry, and um, even though I'm uh, currently working on something for the Countryside Conference, I'm actually going to talk today about a job I held recently, which was for a small um, startup called Sword. And Sword was set up in 2022 and actually closed in 2023. Um, which is probably the key to, to the story. Um, I was the chief policy officer there, and we were set up to look at exactly this problem. We were coming from a corporate angle of how can we fund and um, incentivize farmers to, um, to deploy practices that would enhance the take up of carbon stocks in soil. So we thought our premise was let's start with soil for the many obvious reasons, the co benefits. That, um, of the scale and the potential that's there, um, and the fact that um, there is a carbon market already, so we can sort of draw on the carbon out of the soil. And there was real, real interest. We ended up contracting with, or in <laughs> contracting with. Excuse me, could you speak up a little? The air conditioning is noisy. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, with 70,000 hectares of land, um, so farmers and landowners. And who were prepared to contract with us, and we had a strong pipeline of corporates who wanted to buy soil carbon offset, soil carbon access, essentially. And we um, spent nearly a year looking at how we could do this and how we could deliver high integrity soil carbon offset. And as I say, much less as we closed down. And the reason for that is um, we came up against these limiting factors that Eli has just mentioned. Nobody doubted the fact that supporting soil health was a very good thing, but it was the business model that came across it. And that's, we'll go into more detail um, as we discuss, but I think the top thing I would like to say is we held to the point that we had to have rigor. That means. wrap up, but in a nutshell, we were completely wedded to the fact that we had to have rigorous testing and sampling of the soil to underpin these credits, because without that, we firstly couldn't learn anything about the behavior of the soil. Secondly, we wouldn't know the starting point, which makes an enormous difference in terms of saturation levels and the, the, whether these really you really are, to your point, genuinely sequestering carbon. Um, and then thirdly, we didn't want to be taking bets on farmers' income to find five years down the road they had either sequestered less or more carbon than they thought they might. And finally, we all <laughs> didn't want to contribute to a potential greenwashing where you had um, corporates and perhaps, you know, by no fault of their own, having thought that they had. Uh, delivered on a certain amount of sort of carbon offsetting towards their uh, net zero targets actually hadn't. So we um, will go into, as I say, more detail to sort of where we got to, why we closed down and um, routes through and where we think we could go from here. But those were the problems we came up against in the first instance. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so you will now have evidence that we've got the perfect panel to have a good discussion about this topic. And um, I just want to come back to the Bex point. So um, the government's net zero strategy published late 2021, which if you didn't know is actually due to have a uh, update in the next couple of months, hopefully, imminently, we're hearing from government. Um, so, so things might be different in the new strategy, but at the moment um, it's pathway to net zero in 2050 is expecting to have more BECs than land-based solutions in the UK. Um, but given that there are quite a lot of problems with scale up and, and kind of operational management of BECs in the UK, why, I'd love to hear from you guys, why you think the net zero strategy is running so heavily? Is there a particular reason that BECs is the removal that's kind of had the most um, bets placed on it by government? And are there other things that you think the net zero strategy should be taking much more seriously and, and involving? I mean, we've heard from all of you really that actually a portfolio of solutions is 
is probably the way to go. So why don't you think the government's taking that approach, Eli? I don't know if you've got thoughts. Sure, yeah. I think there's a whole history to why Bex, I think, captured too much public imagination. And it really stems back to the original 1.5 report and other things in the IPCC where the hole was the hole between emissions and where we need to get to was plugged by this big yellow wedge. And it was just labeled Bex. And really it should be labeled greenhouse gas removal. And we should be focusing on which removals we can do most effectively. So the first thing I always do whenever I talk about BACs is say, you know, BACs, bioenergy, presupposes that it needs to be about energy. What about all the other processes that are happening in the UK that take biomass feedstock, do something with it, like brewing beer, fermenting, biogas digestion on farms, wastewater treatment, uh, district heating, which is energy, but not, you know, power BACs. All of these biogenic processes are fall under this umbrella that some people call bikers, biomass carbon removal and storage, or bio CCS, different terms people use. But it's a big family of methods. And I think we've obsessed on a certain flavor of power backs that I think can be really dangerous. And I think we've all seen evidence of that. Not only are there real concerns about the sustainability of the biomass sourcing, the question of does the biomass regenerate and actually consummate the removal, if you will, but you know, it has absolutely no public support. I, we, when I travel to Brussels, I often see on the bus stops these ads that have been taken out, just you know, railing against burning biomass for energy because people don't, people don't, a lot of people don't want that. There's no real political support for it. So I think absolutely we need to look farther afield. We need to focus on removal methods, ideally, that have a limited land footprint <laughs> and a limited energy footprint. So I think waste bikers taking wastewater treatment and biogas digestion, all of these low hanging fruit opportunities, admittedly, it will be difficult to aggregate them and store that CO2, but that's where we should look first, places where we're already using the power of photosynthesis to do something. And we're just forgetting that final step of taking the, the carbon that results from it and storing it. So I think that can form a really important pillar of the net zero strategy. I think also land management is critical, but I think what has lacked consideration is the fact that that is a public good. And first and foremost, you're generating nature conservation, you're creating resilient ecosystems, you're providing livelihoods. That should be financed through as a public good. It should not be shuttled over to the voluntary carbon market where people make, frankly, ridiculous claims on the basis of those carbon credits. Maybe we could talk about that more. So I think just to close, the net zero strategy absolutely needs to think about it, I think just like we learned to put solar where it's sunny and wind where it's windy, if you will, greenhouse gas removal is the same. We have to use the resources we have available to us. In the UK, we're the world's second largest timber importer. We don't have a lot of biomass. What do we have? Geological storage capacity offshore, so we can provide massive amounts of CO2 storage. Uh, we have opportunities for mineralization. We have an agricultural sector. So let's use what's available to us and focus the net zero strategy on that. Let's not artificially try to become a powerhouse in power backs when we don't really have the resources to do that. Are there any thoughts about why the government are doing backs on backs? I think it's worth as well thinking about why the residual emission was so high in the net zero strategy that have led to all of this backs. And what is not talked about in the net zero strategy is behavior change, specifically diet change. And to make space for nature-based removals diet change is the obvious thing to facilitate that happening. Um, we, in our work at Green Alliance, we think it's quite, it, that we think that it's likely that the, the alternative proteins will replace some processed forms of meat and dairy in the coming decades. Um, if Charles Godfrey was talking about this on Farming Day yesterday. Um, so there, there is reason to believe that even without people really making different conscious choices, that um, that that we will eat less meat and dairy in the future, and there's scope for that to change more if people do then make more conscious choices. So I think um, the net zero strategy doesn't really engage in that, which then has meant that less land has been freed up for nature-based removals in the pathway to 2050 that they've imagined, um, compared to what could happen if diets change more then the natural carbon sink could be expanded further than they imagine. And mm. um, yeah, maybe to build on that, because I, I like the way you also approached the reduction side. Um, so I think it's really important when we have these discussions, we always remember the difference between reductions and removals. 
So there's a lot that can be done on land that is actually reductions, not removals. Um, and for a long time, and, and so I think, you know, maybe to answer your question, Helena, maybe one of the reasons we see facts appear a lot and some of those other things we're thinking about don't appear is that good land management can also be seen as reductions. Um, and that's really important because we know that we need to do as much as we can in terms of reductions in all of our sectors before we think about removals. Um, and the important thing I think about sometimes categorizing some aspects of land management under reductions, not removals, is that enables us to think about the public good dimension that Eli mentioned. Um, it also means we're not automatically thinking about these kind of market-based business models, which I, I do think is a real place for those, but recognizing that those might be a market for removals rather than reduction helps us really frame what we're trying to do with each sector. So I think that's that's one reason why you might not see some of those aspects turn up. I do think there's a real historical element. Eli mentioned this. I think it goes back even further. I mean, I think for a long time, people just use facts as, as the equivalent of a negative sign. Like it, it was like the only technology that people knew. So they called it Bex, and that doesn't mean it has to be Bex. And I think the the UK government has a long and interesting history of doing what they consider technology neutral approaches to developing strategies. Um, and so someone here mentioned renewable power. You know, the UK government likes to be technology neutral, but it's very hard to be completely technology neutral because whatever mechanism you create will favor something, whether it's the cheapest or it's the most quickest, the quickest to deploy, the most mature, et cetera. So in a way, it's funny that we're seeing this where we say, oh, they only mention one technology. Usually what we see is they appear to mention no specific technology. And as a result, there's no good development pathway for any technology. So for me, a, an interesting further part of this question or observation that you make is what does that then mean for what the government does, right? So if we think that there's an overweighting of facts, is that a problem in terms of what we see the government do to create um, this ultimately kind of very diverse set of GGR technologies that flourish in the UK, which is where the end game that I think needs to be at. Yes, so just on that, I think um, in terms of, uh, and I agree with all of what you've said, and I also think that um, unfortunately when it comes to kind of, you know, land management and private public ownership, public and private goods are sort of politically hot areas that people don't like to go in. So some of it is just no more complicated than not wanting to tread into political territory and just avoid that as long as possible. Um, I think on the, um, how do you, I totally agree by the way that I don't think we should be relying on the voluntary carbon markets to come in as an enormous white knight and change all of this, but that has to of course be balanced by, we do have to understand that the government can't pay for everything and let's harness private sector money where we can, but getting it into the right places. My starting point would be that, um, so again, my area really is just soil and soil carbon, you know, more, not more broadly, but is actually to really advocate the recommendation of the Office for Carbon Removals, because many of the challenges and the, I suppose, the concerns and the insecurities that kept emerging people, and particularly corporates, possibly getting involved in the voluntary carbon markets were around accounting, were around transparency, were understanding who owns the carbon. Is it suddenly not going to be mine? Is it going to be mine? And I think that you need to have an organizing body that really is focused and helps on that accountability, that transparency, and the sort of the, the nascent soil carbon market is crying out for that. So that that would just be one sort of uh, area I would really advocate for at least speeding up some investment in this area. Um, uh, the other thing I would say is, um, uh, you know, if, again, if we want to speed up the uh, activity in this portfolio approach just with land and understanding what we can and cannot do and what the potential is. My personal take on one of the biggest blockers to all of this is that we've got very poor data about the quality of our soils in the UK and the unit economics around sampling are, are pretty high. So for a normal farmer to sample and test their, their, their soils is about sort of 30 to 40, probably 40 pounds per hectare and they're going to make less than the carbon that they're going to sell. So you've instantly got a, a big challenge for most farmers and managers of land who don't have a diversified income from somewhere else. So what you could do, and one way to route forward, and is to try and sort of gather a lot more of that data and understand what we can meaningfully do or perhaps deliver um, towards net zero and beyond that through soil 
is to roll out as fast as possible mass testing and the farmers and the landowners are the best place to do this. And in Ireland, the government is subsidizing farmers and landowners to do this, do this testing and to put, pull together an enormous database and a sort of taking stock ultimately of where we are now with our soils and then from there, how soils may behave. So, um, you know, that would just be a sort of practical point I would make on kind of advancing our understanding on, on the different uh, portfolio approaches we have right now. Brilliant, thank you. You've all um, picked up on something that was mentioned right at the start by Alyssa as well around um, kind of community <coughs> engagement and public perception and reaction to these kind of new technologies, whether they're engineered or, or, or nature-based solutions. And my sense is with, with a lot of stuff to do with kind of environment and climate, there's a real lack of communication from central government down to the local level about what's being done, why it's being done, the benefits it can bring. You know, most, most climate solutions bring huge societal benefits to people, real good kind of social justice and progressive benefits. And they're often just not communicated very well. So you end up with kind of backlash against certain policies coming in. Um, and it feels like with removals and, and, and bets as well, there's, I don't think that public conversations happens. It's not really happening in the UK. Do you think it's it's just a communication thing? Is there going to have to be kind of quite high levels of community engagement, especially with the, you know, if, if a local town is having a big direct air capture plant built nearby, is, is that going to have to go through a good community consultation process? I'm just really interested to hear your thoughts on, on how this stuff is communicated to the public. Um, I'll, I'll start there as I brought that up. I mean, we do some excellent social science in our wider program, looking at just public perceptions of things like greenhouse gas removal. Um, so broader work with people in the UK to understand what they think about these issues. Um, and it's it's really got to be, it's not just a communication issue, it's a dialogue issue. It's about engaging and listening to people to, and, and understanding their values and how that fits with different things that they want to happen in their neighborhood, which may be about environmental action. It may be a whole range of other things. Um, and that's, I mean, I think that should be good practice for anything, um, not just climate. Um, but some of the interesting things that the research finds is that if you take a kind of a representative sample of, of the UK population, um, they're actually quite open to greenhouse gas removal. Um, and but but they would demand we've had we've had some uh, public workshop to look at these different factors that I said might be important behind good GGR, like that they actually remove greenhouse gas emissions, how long they last for, um, that kind of thing. Um, and some of the things that those, those members of the public identified as things that they would like to see more of, for example, are transparency. So that really tells you that this ongoing dialogue is actively recognized by members of the public, even when they're being actively engaged in the discussion about this topic. So I think it really needs to be something where there's really an openness and a conversation. One of, one of the things that also comes out a lot in the public perception literature, um, which it's easy to get sidetracked on, so we won't spend, I don't want you to get sidetracked on this, but it's an interesting observation, is that in general, members of the public really like things that have the word nature in it. Um, but we have to be really careful um, if you're on the technical side of not being drawn into that because it's very difficult to understand what nature actually means. And also many things that are perceived to be natural are actually quite damaging. So you can, through industrial-based afforestation programs, plant tons of the wrong trees in the wrong places on somebody else's land. And you can do a whole load of disastrous activity that doesn't actually even bring any carbon benefit, let alone wider environmental benefit. But someone could say that that's a nature-based solution, um, and that would automatically resonate more with the public if, if they're not completely local and don't 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 see that happening and how that affects them. Um, so I think, yeah, it, going back to your your basic question, um, I think it's it's much more than just communication. I always I would check myself if I hear myself thinking something like, "If only people understood." If I ever think that, then I'm wrong. I just I say to myself, "You're wrong." That, that, that's not the way things work. Um, probably most of us in this room are quite technocratic. We like the detail, we get into it a lot and so on. Um, we think about how people feel, engage, listen, um, and that's the way to find successful methods. Mm. Yeah, I think there's some sort of table stakes things around procedural justice. If you're building anything, you're putting steel in the ground or building anything. The prop, they're, they're, you know, at this point, there is no excuse for not getting the right social scientists, the right uh, consultants, the people that can put you through a process that's actually going to appropriately incorporate and communicate the benefits and all those things. So that's, you know, the fact that projects still happen that don't do that is insane to me. So 
we can we can put those strings in any sort of public policy to make sure that people are following the best practices about how to engage communities. But I think we have an opportunity to go much for much farther. Um, some colleagues of mine at Carbon Gap have looked really closely at the J40 uh, push in the U.S., where they have this whole direct air capture hub program. I think 3.5 billion dollars have been allocated to build out these greenhouse gas removal hubs, where 40 percent of the benefits have to flow to local communities and projects that submit bids have to demonstrate how they're going to share those those benefits more equitably. You know, the good news is, in most cases, greenhouse gas removal is not a big polluting asset. It's the opposite. It makes ecosystems healthier. It, it, you have the opportunity to scrub other pollutants out of the air at the same time. You know, generally, it makes things better. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't and can't incorporate communities that are going to be affected in mostly positive ways, nevertheless, in understanding that. And I think the final point I would make is specific to the ag sector, which is, you know, I think uh, the pre-read for this was saying, or somewhere was saying that, you know, the, the common agricultural uh, policy basic payments before the UK left the European Union were on the order of 3.5 billion pounds. I think there were all kinds of problems with how those were distributed, but, but suffice to say that, you know, farmers need to be able to make a living wage. They are a critical role. They're, you know, economic powerhouse. They're providing the food we eat. We need to make the act of farming something that is uh, sustainable in every sense of the of the word. And you know, if our understanding of regenerative agricultural practices is correct, transitioning to them should improve yields. It should provide all kinds of benefits. So actually, making that shift, it's going to take time, but it's something that probably is beneficial to everyone. And so, I think that really what we're talking about is a transition that. Definitely yeah. to be farmer led. We can't just sort of say farmers need to become stewards of the land and shift to, you know, protecting and restoring carbon. There's a lot of culture and identity wrapped up in what they're currently doing that might be incompatible with that vision. So this has to come from people that are working on the land. They have to be engaged and it has to be generative. They have to be creating the vision of what their new role in society is going to be. It's not just producing food, it's also stopping soil loss regenerating soil and hopefully also removing and storing carbon. Yes, no, I would agree with that. I think uh, I would sort of two points from my side with uh, with this dialogue. I think it's, you know, it's got to come from the top and it's got to come, as you say, from the roots. And I think the problem has been from the top that the whole sort of belief or kind of commitment to net zero is something that, you know, as I'm sure you're, we're all aware, is still being questioned uh, in certain areas. Won't go into any details, but you know, it is it is still something that there are plenty of people who believe at senior level, given China, given India, given etc., all these other things, the UK should not be punishing itself economically in any size, shape, or form to sort of struggle in terms of tackling climate change. And therefore, what you find is that you don't have a coherent narrative coming out of government in every area. So that means trade policy, that means regulation, that means each department aligning behind a committed goal. And I think that is very confusing for anybody in the public, you know, because if all of your language and all of your direction of travel is not training in the same direction, you get a really, really mixed picture. And that doesn't mean to say that you can't have healthy debate about how you achieve it, but I would say the problem is a little more severe than that, that there's still a question mark whether we should be trying to achieve it in the first place. So I think that that would be my kind of political comment at top level. In terms of on the ground, what I'm seeing, I mean, I think there are many, many reasons and many things we can discuss, you know, the role of councils, et cetera, all the rest of it, capability building. But what I've really has blown my mind is most of the farmers and landowners we've talked to and worked with are there. They are completely there. They are looking at their soils. They are seeing this. They know this. There's also, I have yet to ever to meet a single farmer, not one yet, who is just 100% in the 1950s camp of just, you know, rape and tillage or whatever, pillage, sorry, tillage. Rape and tillage or whatever it may be. And, you know, they are all, it's much more gray than that. There's like sampling a little bit of methodology of this or trialing a bit of that there. And I think for them, or for you know the farmers that I've worked with, where the only issue for them is complete confusion of sort of you know you all know this just as well as I do you know 
are what happens with subsidies, what happens with what I'm paid for. If I'm paid for this, am I therefore cut out of the voluntary carbon market? And it's just a sort of an inner, you know, everyone would freeze off the back of that because you don't know which direction travel to go in. So I, th I think there is a lot of discussion and debate happening at um, amongst pharma clusters. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge. Uh, there's real drive to develop and change practices. I think that is all there. That, that to me, you know, yes, we've got to keep sort of learning and building our knowledge. But I think we need some top level clarity and vision and, um, uh, and drive as well. Great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna open it up to um, audience questions. There's a few online, do keep opening them in the chat, but does anybody in the room have anything for the panel? Uh, yeah, lady over here. Yeah, thank you. Um, Harriet Hamill from Cambridge, and great to hear the diverse presentation, and also a lot of alignment. Um, I was I was interested to hear the proposal uh, earlier, and then more recently on the Office for Carbon Removal, and also as we talked about coherent policy and ability to implement. We don't have a coordination body across government. If we had that, and the Office for Carbon Removal was part of that. I wonder if that would be constructive, but I wonder if we just have an office for carbon removal that just gets lost in uh, the difficulty of coordination and, and creating an implementing policy. This is a, a Green Alliance proposal, so I'm going to let you take that one. <laughs> sure thing. Um, so we think if, if you look at where responsibility <laughs> currently lies across government for greenhouse gas removal it's just all over the place and like you say there's this lack of cord coordination um which we think is needed so that the um so that there is a governing body that is overseeing the scale up of um these technologies so that we end up in a position where we've got approximately um what we need by 2050 and um to stop some of the um poor outcomes happening which we're at risk of if we go down technological routes that are not going to deliver genuine removals that's where this governing body is really um needed so that we see the scale up of approaches that are more likely to deliver those removals thanks lydia um our exec director sean staying in the room is something sean's been talking about for a while so he's probably quite pleased his questions come up um, just a flag as well, in case anyone hasn't seen it, um, Chris Skidmore's Net Zero review that came up recently, um, which is titled Mission Zero, one of his recommendations to government was about, uh, I can never remember what it's called, a Net Zero Delivery Unit or Net Zero Task Force or something sitting across different departments in government. So yeah, that's something that we can agree with as well. Um, any further questions? Yeah? Yeah, just... Uh, Sorry, could you speak up? They're struggling to hear online. Um, Phil Fickness, I'm a private contributor. Uh, very interested in the conversation around around farming and, and land and the sort of country argument between engineers and uh, based solutions. And I wonder if any work had been done to assess the overall opportunity for soils within the soils capture um, in comparison with some of the other solutions like the engineered solutions to decide whether actually it was worth investing a lot more time and effort into that as a solution for carbon dioxide removal because it just seems to be very light in all of the policy uh, that I've seen to date in terms of a way of re removing carbon. So I just wondered if there's been any actual work on that <clears throat> and whether it was more of a or whether it should be more of a priority for you know those active in, in this field in the carbon capture um, committee you know, might appear not to mention hardly mention at all in the context of soils improvement, regenerative agriculture, and all the other benefits associated with that. Well, I think, and I'll be really interested to know if this is sort of focused on this area in your research, because I'm I'm fascinated, <laughs> thrilled that, that the Imperial has this, this big program. I mean, from our perspective, the, the you know, there's a lot of soil science that's going on. There's completely brilliant soil scientists in the UK who we worked with and, and learned what we could. But they, and actually in America, there's there's there's, there's yeah. a, a great deal going on as well. And I think, from my understanding, is it's not that there aren't possibly very very encouraging results. I just think that there are some boundaries and limitations. So, for example, as I was saying, you know, different soil types, saturation levels. 
um, after some, you know, so after a certain point, are you just not sequestering any more carbon? Um, and the so the actual science of it is is you know is evolving. It's it's definitely a good thing, but it's just how far and how much can it can deliver. That that's my understanding of it. But I, I'm not a scientist. Apologies on that. I'll say a few things about where there might be sources, but I can look it up and then maybe come back to you afterwards. Um, I don't I. I don't know if there's been a kind of comprehensive assessment of the scale of the potential in the UK with the like, differentiating between those two different things. But there's also some very good reasons why that's really difficult, some of which you've touched upon. Um, what was published last week, which Eli mentioned, the state of CDR report does look at the maturity of different CDR technologies globally. So that might be worth taking a look at. Um, and it might give you kind of some further support to your perception that that kind of some of the like CCS kind of engineered solutions are further along, but not all of them. Some of them are, are more um, more further along in their exploration. Um, just going back to something I said before, which is that the thing about soils is some part of soil management is actually production and necessarily removal. And so assuming that all of the potential of improving the way in which we manage our soils is necessary removal is one reason why it might not be seen in the same potential bracket of the engineering solutions, that's the first thing. The second thing is we've been investigating scientifically the potential at least for mineral storage of carbon dioxide for a very long time, um, comparatively to soils. So the state of our understanding of how well we can mineralize and store CO2 in the, what Eli referred to, which is a really strong geological base in the UK, we're in a really good position to have lots of potential geological storage, makes it much easier to quantify and see the potential for geological storage at least from that kind of engineer perspective in the UK than soils. Going back to something someone here said about data, um, we have the national, like the, the, the British Geological Survey um, in the UK, which is one of the like world leading geological surveys that understands pretty much all of the UK's rocks in an unbelievable amount of detail. And you can actually go yourself and see that. We don't have that kind of understanding of our soil. Um, and, and, and on the top of it, well, it's not so strange because I guess, the beginning of the scientific revolution started with lots of geologists, I guess, <laughs> and all lots of soil scientists, but also um, because it's a lot harder. So as, as, as kind of you were pointing out, to understand the potential, you have to understand the current status, and it can be different across a very small area, like the sort of the carbon storage within one kind of plot of land. So I, I think to then say, and therefore here's the potential of storage in the soils is just much, much harder than, you know, we're just, Kind of behind scientifically. Um, having said that, I will go away and look at and see what what might else be out there to kind of answer your question. And a tiny addendum, I think it's kind of like your point that before we have any discussion about removals, we need to look really carefully at does the net zero strategy make an ambitious enough plan to reduce emissions? Same thing for soils. As I'm hearing, we're in a soil crisis, a global soil crisis. We're losing soil, so best stop that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, best that we stop the depletion of the soil carbon stock. Like we get the net zero emissions, which is the cessation of the accumulation of carbon. Once we get the net zero, then we can actually go net negative. Same with soils. Once we get to net zero soil loss, we can go to gross positive soil accumulation. Um, I think the key point, though, is after we get back to you on these very specific numbers uh, for their different storage capacities, you know, on a global standpoint, the, the sort of cap of how much soil you can, how much carbon you can store in soils and other terrestrial systems is, is very much limited relative to geological storage capacity. So, so yeah, it's like, it's an order of magnitude more capacity in geological reservoirs. So the priority for, for ecosystems and landscapes is to stop destroying them, get them back as best we can to where they were, maybe at the beginning of the Neolithic revolution, like let's restore. So, but once you restore those carbon stocks, you kind of reach a cap, right? And there might be instances where just come back. Uh, do you mind carrying the conversation on afterwards? We've got quite a lot of questions online. Um, just want to pick one of these up. Um, Lydia, this is perhaps one for you, uh, from someone anonymous online. It seems that urgent changes to consumption patterns are required, but it keeps getting brushed under the carpet. If consumption isn't reduced and engineered solutions aren't achieved, are we honestly facing a different scenario? <laughs> Cheery one. <that> one. <laughs> um, I think... I think we shouldn't be overly optimistic about our prospects of reaching net zero, right? I think there's all this interesting work that goes on on how optimistic you have to be to get to carry people along with you, because if all you do is tell everybody that 
everything's going to be awful that nobody is motivated to do anything about it so i think it's i think it's important to have a vision and to believe that um net zero is possible which i genuinely do think it is but that it does require hard choices to be made and um the and there is uncertainty within that and there's a question for us in terms of how much uncertainty are we as society willing to take on in the likelihood of us reaching net zero and if we want to be really certain of getting there then cutting emissions and not um and, and just avoiding um continued high levels of emissions would be the uh, most certain way to um, mitigate climate impacts if there's uncertainty in um the our ability to scale up these removal technologies um but there's there's just so many um so many like i don't think people are going to completely stop flying and completely stop eating meat and dairy to cut our emissions as far as possible so i think it is important to look at what has to happen um to get to net zero given the scale of behavior change that we think is likely um but we just don't know what's going to happen to 2050 um in terms of how people will behave or in terms of technological development so i think we just have to keep going with these plans keep assessing are we on track what needs to happen to get us on track and keep in the back of our mind that doom scenario is possible but um there's no point accepting that already We've got time for one more quick question. Yeah. I'd like to um, I'm Kai, I'm the founder of Carbon Tech. So I've been working with a lot of sustainable fashion brands, helping them understanding the emissions that goes into producing a specific garment until it goes to either landfill or going to be recycled. So a lot of some pullback or hesitations I have heard from those VPs of sustainability are like, how is this result uh, trustworthy? Is it possible that we can include that in our annual sustainability report? And is there a third body that we can include to verify and audit this entire process? So I'm wondering, like, from your different industry backgrounds, have you come to the same challenge or problem? Like, what is your solution to it? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yes, 100%. I mean, I think, you know, for soil, I, I don't want to sort of completely derail to soil, but it's, yes, uh, a lack of, uh, you know, MRV and accountability and having um, an index ultimately that enables people to have confidence in the in the offset or the, you know, the, the removal asset that they are purchasing um, is a real problem. It's, a, it's definitely a real problem in the soil carbon market. So, I mean, yes. No short answer is yes, but there's but there's there's a lot of reasons, particularly with soil, why that is problematic. And as has been discussed, you know, this is not a permanent solution. It's there's it's it's a lot harder to, to monitor and verify. So um, yeah, I think um, I think one your point about farmers being faced with this confusion and that making them not take action is very similar to your point about corporate leaders who. Yeah, for whatever reason. Analysis uh, paralysis. <laughs> yes, and and I think that points to the need to you know end this charade of having a voluntary carbon market. So I think what's great about the UK is with the net zero law, which comes into effect in 2023, every publicly listed company must have a net zero plan above some threshold. And in that plan, they have to specify which are they relying on carbon credits to any extent, which anyone who's claiming progress towards net zero today would be because i don't know any companies that are not emitting any carbon that would be amazing so that, i think we can keep putting pressure on you know on the uk to say you know let's take this one step further let's require that you disclose exactly which carbon credits you purchase and you know oxford net zero we worked on a document called the oxford principles for net zero aligned offsetting which tried to start a conversation about when can a company such as the ones you're speaking to claim to have achieved net zero and under what conditions. And we, we put forward a, a thesis on that. So I think uh, the UK is probably farther along of any country I know of, they're, they're almost there. We just need to get them to go that last step and say, if you are a company over a certain size, you must have a net zero plan. You must disclose your carbon credits and they have to match the nature of your emissions. If you're emitting a bunch of fossil carbon, then it's not legitimate to say you're socking it away in soils and you've achieved net zero. Those are fundamentally different things. So that level of guidance 
needs to be provided to end that confusion because in the voluntary carbon market, it's an absolute mess. And the reality is they can do whatever they want. Absolutely. And that's not useful. So the final point there would be the other thing we can do to put pressure on the UK and, and the EU is advertising regulation. We have bodies whose job it is to protect the public from fraudulent claims. And just like, you know, no one's going to sell a bottle of water, I hope, with BPA in it. You know, we, you shouldn't be able to sell a carbon credit that doesn't deliver what it says. So we have the power to complain to the advertising regulator. This has happened in the case of Shell and in the case of EasyJet. And we can keep doing that. And we can get to a point where from two sides, we're helping companies have clarity on what they need to do to make a real legitimate claim. Can, can I just add something very quickly? Yeah, okay. run over I mean, I think, I think you, were, you were talking also about the, the veracity or the, the, the trustability, the, the trust yeah. that people can see like different standards. <laughs> so just like from, from sort of my history of my career, there are lots of different ways that you can have a kind of stamp attached to your greenhouse gas, like your, your carbon credits. And I think one of the things that, you know, there's lots that's not great about the voluntary sector, but in a way, the voluntary sector has been helping us explore what those standards could be and should be. So, you know, in the voluntary sector, there are lots of different organizations that create methodologies. And then those methodologies are things that, against which you can say, yeah, this person sold me this, and this was the methodology and offers some traceability. But eventually what we want to see is the maturation of those many voluntary methods into something that matches the legislated standard and then goes through very technical processes of monitoring, reporting, verification by an accredited, separately accredited body. And that's when you get that absolute certainty for the, the person who's selling it. I think all of that needs to be approached with maybe some humility, because I think that's one of the challenges with the voluntary carbon market as well, is that these things are presented as being certainly excellent. And we're all on the journey to making things as excellent as we can at a given time. And I think that will help with better accountability. Mm. Great, thank you. There's obviously lots of good questions and conversations, so I encourage you to continue them at lunch.